Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship uh, on this, the Lord's Day. A couple of announcements for you this morning. Um, most of you know our secretary, Bobby, is, uh, has just finished her official work for us here. She'll retain her membership. Um, but please join us next week after worship for a celebration of all of the ministry and all of the love that she shared with us in this place. Um, next week, right after worship, we'll have a celebration for her. I also want to let you know, uh, many of you know this at this point, but um, Stephanie Erickson Russell is going to be our new secretary. Um, hi, Stephanie. <laughs> Stephanie, we're so excited that you're going to be joining us in work and mission and ministry, and um, can't wait to get going. Glad you're here. Um, we also have a new member class today, right after worship. We'll meet in the library um, about 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes after the end of service. Um, we'll spend a little bit of time together, and we'll meet every week until the end of May, which I think is four weeks. Um, so we'll enjoy that time together. Um, other announcements this morning. Okay, let me start. <laughs> I see lots of hands. Dale, I'll get to you in a minute. All right. Mary and Sharon. <laughs> Yes, the cart is right around the corner in the fellowship hall, unless it's moved. Mary, do you have something else? Yes, uh, just wondering if anybody would be willing to join one of the coffee groups. We need maybe two more families to kind of even out the, the coffee groups, and you only serve every two months, every two and a half months, so it isn't like you're serving once a month or anything. So we do need like two more couples. All right. Talk to Mary or, uh, yeah, go ahead, Debbie. Thank you, Debbie. Daryl, you're up. Good morning. Uh, Galen and Andy Tuttle want me to tell everybody you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for what you guys did last weekend. Um, we raised $1,005. They also want me to tell you part of it's going to go to buying a truck so they can, Andy's going to drive the truck to the front. Um, they're going to bring the medical supplies and food to them. So you guys are unbelievable. Thank you. Let us rise and worship God together.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, by whose hands we are given new birth, by whose speaking we are given new life. Amen. Let us pray. God of love, you have chosen to work through your people, to work through your church, to work through your disciples. Help us to be your disciples and to be your true church this day as we worship you and seek to serve one another in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are welcomed, restored, and supported as citizens of this new creation. Holy God, holy and merciful, holy and mighty, you are the river of life. You are the everlasting wellspring. In mercy and might, you have freed us from death and raised us with Jesus, the firstborn of the dead. In baptismal waters, our old life is washed away, and in them we are born anew. Glory to you, O God, for oceans, lakes, and rivers. Honor to you for waters that wash us, cleanse us, quench our thirst, and nurture both crops and creatures. Praise to you for the life-giving water of baptism, the outpouring of the spirit of the new creation. Wash away our sin and all that separates us from you. Empower our witness to your resurrection. Strengthen our resolve in seeking justice for all. Satisfy the world's needs through this living water, O oh God. Where drought dries this earth, bring refreshment. Where despair prevails, grant hope. Where chaos reigns, bring peace. We ask this through Christ, who with you and the Spirit reigns forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, is the way, the truth, and the life. Give us grace to love one another, to follow in the way of his commandments, and to share his risen life with all the world. For he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we hear the word of God. Good morning. The first reading is from Acts chapter 7, verses 55 through 60. Stephen was one of the seven men chosen by the apostles to serve tables so that the apostles could be free to serve the word in Acts 6. Stephen does more than distribute food, however. For his preaching of God's word, he becomes the first martyr of the faith. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. Here ends the first reading. Our psalm will read responsively by whole verse, Psalm 31, verses 1 through 5 and 15 and 16. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. For you are my crag and my stronghold. For the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. For you are my 
Into your hands I commend my spirit, for you have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Let your face shine up on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Our second reading is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. Christ is the cornerstone of God's saving work and the foundation of our lives. We are God's chosen, holy people who continuously celebrate and declare the mercy of God we experience through Jesus Christ. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, see, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him shall not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious, but to those who do not believe, the the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people, Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. After he had washed the disciples' feet, he said to them, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may also be. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas, one of his disciples, said to Jesus, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus replied, I am the way. I am the truth, I am the life. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Today's sermon is about two things. One, the stoning of Stephen, which was our first reading this morning, a tough passage to really think through, we must be honest. And two, one of the wildest, most outlandish uh, five words in the whole English language, some of my favorite combinations of words, a really interesting one, it goes like this, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. It's really interesting because um, when we hear people say that, I feel like, I don't know, I at least think, are we sure? <laughs> it is it really everything happened for a reason? I mean, like, we have a cat. Andrea and I have a cat. Um, 
He's a little rambunctious. He likes to climb where he doesn't like to go, as cats like to do. Sometimes he likes to, or I don't know if he chooses to or not, he'll knock things off the shelf. So a couple of days ago, we had this uh, nice kind of bowl thing that was actually already cut in half because I knocked it off last year. Uh, but it was very pretty because it had this nice little curve. Well, Winston the cat um, climbed where he was not supposed to, and now it's you know not just one big piece. It's like, I don't know, 15 or something like that. Um, does that happen for a reason? I, I don't know. It might be that just Winston is a cat that doesn't respect anyone and is a nihilistic little jerk, but who knows? Uh, Here's another one. Our, um, for, like, probably since we changed our locks when we bought this house, our doorknob, we can't get it to, I say we, uh, Andrea can't get it to really put it on there because I know nothing about these things. Um, so we've now, we're now on at least our second doorknob and we've tightened it a whole bunch of times. We bought a really nice doorknob and no matter what happens, um, it just keeps coming loose and then coming off and then we have to fix it. We, Andrea has to fix it. Um, she does a very good job. I think she, she said she got, she, she figured something out. So we'll see. Um, does that, does God just hate our doorknob? <laughs> I don't know, maybe. Or, or um, why, I'm sure many of you have asked this question, why do the Vikings always lose in the playoffs? <laughs> Is it because God hates purple and yellow? I mean, Maybe there's something to that, I don't know. Um, <laughs> my point is not just to kind of rag on this saying, these five little words, um, or even especially not to rag on those who like really have this deeply held belief. It can, though, be a dangerous thing to say. One of my teachers in seminary told a rather sobering story once. He had just been diagnosed with cancer. And as he was trying to figure out what this means, one of his neighbors came and paid him a visit and told him, it's okay, it's, it's going to be okay. Everything happens for a reason. Well, no, quite frankly, I'm, I'm not sure it does. Maybe, maybe, but I'm not sure it does. Some of these are funny, some of these are not, but I think what we really mean when we say something like this, is that God has a plan and it's gonna be okay for you. God's gonna make this okay. Which, you know, can help us make sense, especially of, of other people's pain. And some of us, that really works for us. Others of us, it really doesn't. So today, I've got a challenge for your thinking. And that's to say what we really mean. I've got a little, a little tweak to these five little words. And it comes today in response to the story of the stoning of Stephen that we read earlier. Now, Stephen is introduced to us in the, gospel, uh, the book of Acts, which is kind of part two of the Gospel of Luke. Stephen is at, introduced because of, um, well, because of a church fight that comes from maybe where all church fights come from. Maybe you're thinking the same thing that I'm thinking. For thousands of years, church fights have started in the church kitchen. <laughs> this is a, start, a fight that started in the church kitchen because the disciples, Peter and those close followers of Jesus were just too doggone dedicated to the word and to prayer. Doggone it. So there was this fight that started from the distribution of food and the caring of widows and orphans, also important, of course. And so Stephen becomes one of the seven people, they would maybe be called deacons, who sees to the administration of food, the, the care of people's physical needs. And so Stephen, being uh, ordained as a cook and as a servant, what does he naturally do? He goes and starts preaching the word, of course. And this kind of gets him into trouble. He's in the temple every day, and 
okay, Stephen has a lot of firsts for realizing this. He's part of maybe the first church uh, kitchen fight. He's maybe also the first lay preacher. Um, in the Lutheran church, we call them Sam synodically authorized ministers, the people who are not ordained as a pastor, but they preach sometimes every week at small churches, even larger ones. Um, and so Stephen becomes this preacher, and he makes himself some enemies really quickly, like really, really fast. But he's also kind of like blessed with this gift of the Holy Spirit and, and power. And so Stephen receives some opposition from those who were listening to him. And he, kind of like Jesus, was put, put on trial by the Sanhedrin. So our story starts in the temple gates, somewhere within the temple compound, and Stephen's being put on trial, and he begins to preach. And then for 52 verses, it's the longest sermon in the whole of the Gospel of Acts. This is almost an entire chapter. Stephen preaches, and you know when a, a speaker or a preacher starts their speech with, since the beginning of time, humanity has, you know it's going to be a really long speech. <laughs> this is kind of what Stephen does, too. He goes all the way back to Abraham, and he traces the course of the Old Testament and the course of his people, the people of God, through to the present day. And I spent a good amount of time this week trying to figure out what this sermon means. Like, what was Stephen really trying to get at with this 52-verse sermon that was, uh, you know, copied over into the Gospel of Acts? And um, where he kind of ends up is that God the God we know in the Old Testament and the God we knew then and the God we know today, God does not live in houses made by human hands. Now remember, Stephen is saying that God does not live in houses made by human hands in the temple. The temple. Not, not a temple. The temple. The temple, which was like quite literally a house made by human hands for God. And he's saying this while he is on trial for blasphemy. And this, this doesn't make him any friends. And this, combined with his vision of the heavens being opened up, gets him stoned by his opponents. But I want to read for you what happens after this happened. I want you to listen to what the Holy Spirit did in response to this pretty, pretty vicious, gruesome, painful death of Stephen. That day, a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Devout people buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both women and men. He committed them all to prison. Now those who were scattered from place to place, proclaiming the word, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. The crowds with one accord listened eagerly to what was said by Philip, hearing and seeing the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud shrieks, came out from many who were possessed, and many others who were paralyzed or lame were cured. So there was great joy in that other city. What did you hear that the Holy Spirit did in response to the stoning 
of Stephen. What, what did you hear? Anybody catch anything? There's no wrong answers here. Mercy. There's mercy, yeah. There was mercy for Stephen, right? There's mercy for, uh, there's those who loved him, gave him a good burial and grieved his loss. Yeah, what else did you hear? There was some bad stuff that happened too. Anybody catch it? Well, there's a couple things that happened. First, there was this persecution of the church that began that day. And then because of that persecution, the disciples fled from Jerusalem. Now, up to this point in the Gospel of Acts, the whole church, all of the followers of Jesus, had been living in Jerusalem. In one city, they had been attendees to the temple. They had all been right there. They had all been going to that house made by human hands. But because of the stoning of Stephen and what happened afterward, the disciples were spread out. They, were, they had to, in a sense, flee from Jerusalem. And because of that, they spread the word beyond the house made by human hands. So, in a sense, Stephen's message, this sermon that he gave in the house made by human hands, is actually fulfilled because of what was done to him. Because he was stoned and because this persecution of the church began, then the disciples began to go out beyond Jerusalem, beyond the temple, and to proclaim the good news, the gospel, to heal the sick, to care for people. And the good news of Jesus was spread, began to spread far and wide. Stephen proclaims that God does not dwell in houses made by human hands, and then the Holy Spirit spreads the gospel of love beyond the house made by human hands. This tells us something. But I've got a couple of stories for you. Yesterday, I got the chance to do a couple of really exciting things. One was to go to the Presbytery meeting of the Presbytery of Northern Waters, all the way over in Bayfield, Wisconsin. And in the midst of some really good discussion and getting to meet some of these Presbyterian folks um, and business, of course, we also approved the gifting of a church building from one church to another. Maybe you saw this in the paper. I think it's Westminster Presbyterian Church in West Duluth has decided and has now started the process of giving their building to the neighborhood church, which has been in Cloquet for eight years, I think. Um, and at the end of the meeting, this elderly gentleman who was a member of this church asked for the privilege to speak to the assembly. And he told the story of that church. It had been around since the 1860s, I think. He and uh, the other members of that church, most of the current members of that church had started together in confirmation and knew each other from seventh grade and were still there today. He talked about the life that he lived in this place and the community that was built. And it was clear to see the grief that was in his voice, the loss that this change was bringing about. But there was also clearly some hope and excitement in his voice for what it was going, for what the place, for what that space was going to do. Now, did God make Westminster Presbyterian Church decline? Did God make or let this church die? No, I don't think so. 
It just did. Sometimes things just happen. And this just happened. And it was hard and it is hard. And did God do something good with these people's faithfulness in response to their decline? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the first thing I got to do yesterday. The second thing is something a bit deeper and harder to make sense of, and that's the health and struggles of Janae Shodan. Um, yesterday, many of you were there. We had a um, benefit auction and food put on for several hours. I don't know Janae or her family like so many of you do. I can't even imagine the pain of seeing a daughter or a granddaughter struggle for her life and struggle to wake up. We must acknowledge that it's not okay. It's not fair. And nothing we can say, none of our theologizing can make it okay. We also saw yesterday evening hundreds and hundreds of people come together to support Janae and her family. I saw volunteers give their time and energy. People give of their money. A dispersed community come together and love shared with a family in pain. We also keep seeing Janae's mother share her experiences and reflections in the context of her faith. Let's be clear, none of these things make it okay. This is not a balance it out kind of thing where a bad thing and a good thing kind of equal out. It's not that at all. But I used to hear, back before I was a pastor especially, I used to hear people who were struggling with their faith or people who were not Christians say what they were really thinking, and that's that how could God ever let something like this happen to someone so young or someone so good or someone that I love so much. And you know, I don't think that God picks and chooses who to rescue from a terrible accident and who not to rescue. I think the best that we can say, the best that we can understand, is that some things just happen. Some things just happen because sin and evil and death are real in the world, and that's just the kind of world we live in. The God we know, the God we know in Jesus did not cause Stephen to die. And God doesn't cause churches to close. And God doesn't just stop some car accidents and let others happen. But what we learn from the death of Stephen is, in a sense, the same thing that we learn from the Easter message, and that is that God can take the very worst things in the world and bring some good out of it. The worst sins, the worst griefs, the worst catastrophes, the very worst parts of human experience, God can do something good with it. So we began this sermon by wondering if everything happens for a reason. So I'd like to make a change to that. I think what we really want to say when we think this is that God can bring good out of anything. God did not kill Stephen, but God can bring good out of anything. God doesn't end churches, but God can do good out of anything. God doesn't just cause or let car accidents happen, but God can bring good 
sometimes even just a little bit of good out of anything and nothing in life or in death or beyond death can ever separate us from this God who can bring good out of anything. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to invite those uh, among us who have had a baptismal birthday. Do we have these slides today, Joel? Okay. Those who have had a baptismal birthday in April, or maybe if you missed it in March, are those who have had a baptismal birthday in the last couple of months here today. Come on forward. Gather around the font. Pat, mine was March, and I forgot to do it in March. So. Uh, we're in good company today. Let's gather around the font and face the front. In your baptism, Jesus saved you from your sin and death and received you into God's family. You were given new life and the promise that the Holy Spirit would be always with you to forgive you daily and to help your faith grow. As you have matured in the faith and in understanding of your baptism, I ask you, do you believe that through your baptism, God has graciously forgiven your sins and welcomed you into God's family? Do you believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit as we confess our faith in our creeds? I do believe in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you believe that as you remember your baptism day by day, by confessing your sins in Jesus' name and praying for God's direction in your life, 
God both forgives your sins and gives you strength through the Holy Spirit to be strengthened in your faith and your witness to God's love in Jesus Christ. I do. Do you intend to continue in this faith in which you have been baptized? I do, and I ask God to help each day. I'll invite you, um, maybe we can do this for each other. Um, so why don't we dip a finger in here and then turn to a person next to you and help them to remember that they are baptized with the sign of the cross on their forehead. Is that okay? Remember that you are baptized. People of God, remember that you are baptized and sealed with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, in your Son, Jesus' death and resurrection, you redeemed the world to yourself. In our baptism, you have claimed each of us as your own. Continue to walk with us, together and individually, that our faith might be daily reaffirmed by your grace. Through your Holy Spirit within us, make our lives to be a witness to your love and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And please rise as you are able. Together we'll confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. United in the hope and joy of the resurrection, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Let us pray. God of life, strengthen your foundation in your church to proclaim your gospel even in times of trouble and pain. As we remember Stephen this day, we give thanks for deacons and for synodically authorized ministers. Bless all deacons and Sams and strengthen them for the bridge building ministry between church and the world. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Creating God, you show your steadfast love through mighty waters, towering mountains, verdant fields, and arid deserts. Protect your creation's habitats from pollution, erosion, extinction, and climate change. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Mighty God, your spirit dwells among us and guides us into all truth. Give wisdom to the world and to leaders at whatever lead, uh, level they lead. We pray today especially for the people of Dallas and the families of those who lost their lives. We pray also that the increasing violence in our country may come to an end. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Loving God, you make your home among us and you provide us with an eternal home. Abide with refugees, with those experiencing homelessness, those fleeing war or poverty, and all who question if there is a home in you. We pray today also for those who are sick, we pray for Janae 
for all those sick and ailing in our community and those we name before you now. We lift up all of these people, all of these children of yours up to you, trusting that you hear our prayers, whether we have spoken them aloud or whether they have remained on our hearts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Assuring God, you accompany your people amid uncertainty and change and loss. Uphold people in this community who have recently moved changed jobs or schools, retired, or are going through transitions of any kind. Lead us in your ways, O God. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Renewing God, you gather the saints at your heavenly banquet. We pray today especially for those who grieve, and we give you thanks for the care shown us by all those who have gone before us. Grant confidence and comfort for all awaiting the place that you have prepared for us. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise up to you, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. As we share the peace today, remember that you can share with a handshake, a hug, or any way that you feel comfortable. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Share with one another a sign of the peace of Christ. Peace with with your plates. What was that? Oh, plates. That's a good question. We haven't. I don't know. Um.
Please rise as you are able. Let us pray. Generous God, in this meal you offer your very self. We give thanks for these gifts of the earth. In the breaking of this bread, reveal to us the rising one. In the pouring of this wine, pour us out in service to the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We commune today by coming forward, taking a piece of bread and then a cup on either side. Uh, all of the purple is wine, the white is grape juice. Also, all of the bread is gluten-free. Um, and then you can return the cup to the holder on either side. If you prefer to commune from your seats, you can either give us a wave and we'll come back to you or let someone in the back know and they'll find you a pre-filled cup where you can commune from where you are. Know also that all and everyone are welcome at this table. For we know that this table does not belong to us. It instead belongs to the Lord. And all that God asks of us is to have a heart that desires to know God. So know that you are welcome here no matter what. On the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take this and eat it. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after supper, Jesus took a cup. He gave thanks for it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take this and drink it. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, remember me. Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come, for all are welcome, and all is now ready.
It's the body of Christ given for you. 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 One Lord of all. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ Please rise as you are able. Let us pray. Gracious God, in you we live and move and have our being. With your word and the seal of grace, you have nourished our life together. Strengthen us to show your love and serve the world in Jesus' name. Amen. People of God, receive now this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. <laughs>
Go in peace, serve the risen one. Thanks be to God.